welcome back to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm really excited you're here. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm here today with a special guest, Ben Irwin, C CEO of Charity Buzz. And so we have a lot buzzing, don't we? We sure do. I'm excited to be here. Uh, talk a little bit about what we do and um, all the different ways we're thinking about the charity sector. You know, Ben, I love your whole premise and i can't wait to get into it because you're going to talk to us about two different things and that is is that the pie the whole pie has changed in the nonprofit sector and what we're looking at and what we can get in terms of our own piece of that pie is shifting and changing and i think that we need to have a really deep discussion about that because not everybody understands that we're hearing things that make us a little uncomfortable, and yet it's hard to understand what it looks like across the landscape of the nonprofit sector. Another thing that we have to talk about are our amazing presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, 180 Management Group, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episode, your part-time controller and nonprofit thought leader. These are the folks that support the nonprofit show day in and day out. So we can have amazing conversations like we're gonna have today with Ben Irwin. We also have amazing co-hosts. I'm flying solo today, um, but we've been rolling them out over the last couple of months. They come from all over the country and they do amazing things in our sector. They're incredibly diverse, um, really exciting, intelligent people. And um, I hope you're, you're enjoying getting to know them uh, as I am. Another person we want to get to know today is Ben Irwin, CEO of Charity Buzz, charitybuzz.com. Okay, you really create a lot of buzz in our nonprofit sector, Ben. Talk to us what about what Charity Buzz does. Yeah, so like the simple premise behind Charity Buzz and why we started the business and what we believe more today than ever is a world where more money goes to the charity sector mm -hmm. delivers better outcomes for everyone. So the way we do it is by trying to increase the size of the pie by offering up uh, customers, donors, philanthropists, really, really unique, in most cases, money can't buy experiences, <laughs> all in support of terrific charitable organizations. So it's a destination to live out uh, your wildest dreams. And for the fundraiser, the charity, it's a platform to get your organization and fundraising in front of a brand new audience because Charity Buzz has spent the better part of 15 years cultivating what we believe is the world's most generous and incredible customer base. Hundreds of thousands of folks who are socially conscious, affluent, and they want to do really, really fun and unique stuff. And they love that a portion of it goes to support organizations working on really, really important causes. Okay. So talk to me about your latest, um, I'm going to call it a get, because that's what we use in production. Your latest get, your latest product. Um, I know that um, you emailed me something about it and I was just, I was stunned. So talk to us about this thing with none other than George Clooney. Yeah, so we are we're really excited. Uh, currently live is our second installment of A Good Evening with George Clooney to support his Foundation for Human Rights and Social Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an event that we host, that we put on. Uh, it's a series, we've done it with other luminaries. Uh, but George Clooney is the proverbial man of the hour. Yeah. So a lot of what we typically sell are experiences carved out of other events, award shows, premieres, movie sets. That's great. People love it. But we, we don't control the experience as much as we do when we host and produce it ourselves. And that's where a good evening uh, came about. So through our different uh, platforms and channels, we're able to curate a really small and intimate, uh, intimate evening with incredible celebrities like George Clooney. Uh, this year it'll be in New York City. Next month it'll be at a private residence and 16 to 18 probably uh, really lucky and generous individuals will have the chance to really spend time with him. It's not a meet and greet. It's not, you know, your assembly line of handshake mm -hmm. photo. It is hours getting to know him, learning about his work, and really just being able to um, have a real connection with an individual who otherwise I think most people would think would be impossible to do it with. 
Well, and dare I say, and I mentioned this in the green room, you know, for folks like that, it gives them an opportunity to hear what donors are thinking and saying, right? And that's really unique because to your point, it's not that cocktail hour meet and greet and then you're on to the next thing. I mean, this is a, a concentrated amount of time where everybody can really learn from one another and listen to what's going on. So super fascinating. I think it's amazing. And if you go on to charitybuzz.com, you'll be able to see some of these experiences that are offered up. Um, so one more quick question. This is kind of for the donor that wants to go through at some point in time. It's not always um, a call to action from an event or something like that, right? I mean, you can, that's kind of one of the things I think that's so intriguing about this, Ben. Yeah. So what I truly believe is we need to create complementary slash incremental ways for charities to raise money. Um, if an organization runs a really successful event that accomplishes all of their goals, we want them to continue to run that event. We want to figure out other ways, either in conjunction or outside their event, to raise uh, incremental funds, to figure out ways to drive more unrestricted dollars to their organization. And that's what we do. It's not a one size fits all. It's a bespoke solution. We develop strategy, work directly with our charity partners to come up with really, really great experiences. And then the time of year you sell these experiences could have a tremendous impact on how much money they raise for your organization. Different times of year have different trends and demand cycling. And by having a a defined audience that's always engaged on Charity Buzz, you don't have to wait for your spring or fall fundraiser. You can be a right. little Yeah, I think that's the thing that um, struck me and why I asked that question is because, you know, so many nonprofits, they bleed themselves dry to get that one gala done. And it's a if it's a big ballroom, it might have 600, maybe 900 people. Um, and that's, you know, four hours that they kill themselves to get something over that period of time. And then everything, everybody else is trashed. They're exhausted. They forget, they move on, right? Where some, an engagement like this um, can, can give you, you know, a lot of bang for the buck, uh, if you will, moving forward. Well, let's talk about this, this concept that you, you know, are thinking about, and that is that the sector de deserves more fundraising innovation. And what does that look like to you? Yeah. Great question. So I've spent the past 15, 16 years working at this intersection of technology, entertainment, commerce, and charity. And the one thing I know for sure is the charity sector has so much growth in front of it. And I think it's incumbent of all of us to figure out ways to incentivize innovation, figure out ways for it to raise more money. Again, if we believe that if more money goes to the charity sector, and that equals positive outcomes for everyone, then we all are obligated to do it. The problem is fundraising has been stagnant for 50, 60 years. They started in the 70s measuring the percentage of GDP that was donated to charity in the United States. It has not significantly deviated from 2% since they started measuring it. But the number of charities has expanded by 40 to 50x. So now you're a charity, the relative size of the pie is the same, but you can barely even get a slice. And, and that's why we need to think outside and innovate of just um, going out to our existing donor base every day, every week, every month, and asking them just to give us money based on the work that we're doing. We need to continue to do that, but we clearly need to do more if we want to get that 2% to grow and to adequately fund the charity sector. Right. I love that you bring this up because I feel like this time in our country and, and it's it's really our country, but, you know, there, there's a global uh, implication here. But we seem to think that there is just this phenomenal amount of wealth that's being created. And indeed it is. And indeed it's transference. Uh, when you think about the um, transference of wealth just from the baby boomers in all of this, we keep hearing about this money. And I think there's this sense that if you're just a smart nonprofit, you're going to get it. But you don't, we're not talking about what you said so brilliantly, the pie. It's not the piece of the pie as much as what we need to step back and look at that pie and say, okay, what's going on here? And where is this money? And 
and how is it being navigated through? We use here on the nonprofit show 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the U.S. Yep. That's a hell of a lot of action, my friend. That's a lot. Of, and a lot of them are doing a lot of the similar things. So how do you how do you compare yourself to a competitor within the okay. same sector or cause area as you mm -hmm. who deserves the money, who has the bigger marketing budget? It's right. It's a lot more similar to the for profit sector than I think everybody realizes or wants okay. to appreciate. But it's time we do it because there's a lot of for profit principles that could really benefit the charity sector. I think just society has to get behind it and say, we want you to go solve this complex problem. Let's give you the resources and the ability to go do it. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. And, and I think there's like this, this dirty side of, I mean, we even use different vocabulary. The lexicon of, of nonprofit management is even different. You know, we don't want to say profit. We want to say revenue. We want to say, you know, different, different words in the accounting side so that we don't appear to be for profit. And yet if we don't garner that profit, we don't have that investment to make in our solutions. Right. I mean, if, if we, if we can't produce, then we can't solve. So really interesting. I mean, you're, you're definitely speaking my language here. Let's talk about this going back to the pie and, and your your really interesting assessment about the donor um, landscape, what the that funding landscape, I should say, it looks like. What are you seeing about the GDP impacts of donor giving versus this really interesting concept of measuring it against non-essential activities? First of all, define what a non-essential activity is. Yeah, so uh, the head of my business development team pulled this together for a recent training we did in the office. But we we combine it's restaurants, it's travel, it's cultural right. experiences. Think about uh, going out, concerts, uh, museums, you name it. All the things that the American consumer spends money on that are not essential. This is discretionary right. income, and there has right. there's a lot of discretionary income flowing through the American consumer. The problem is it's not going to the charity sector. So th this part of GDP, I think currently is around 27% of GDP and it's growing. Mm -hmm. This part of pie, this, this pie is growing at a feverish pace. So what I think about when I review this data is how can we figure out a way to funnel some of these dollars, this 27% and get that money mm -hmm. in the hands of the charitable organizations? Because one percent of it, ten percent of it, ten percent of non activity spending in a year is more than the total amount of money going to the charities. So we be okay with something being stagnant for 50, 60 years. We clearly need to figure out other ways to compel people to give. And if we know they're spending more money over here, then let's shift some of our focus over here. And that's what we do. We everything we offer on Charity Buzz is a non essential activity. It's a, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is available opportunity. It's lavish luxury travel. It's bespoke merchandise. Nobody needs them, but they want them because they're unique. They want them maybe because if they don't buy them now, they may never get the chance to do it again. A money can't buy experience and they want to support a charity. So we're, the money that's being spent on Charity Buzz does not come out of the same pocket as a wealthy person's charitable fundraising for a given year. It's in addition to that budget. Mm -hmm. So there in our little world, we're increasing the pie amongst the people we touch. We just need a lot of other organizations and companies to, to join and mm -hmm. to be pushing this forward. And that's how we're gonna make some meaningful change. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really an interesting thing. I mean, if, if you've gone to any charitable, uh, you know, I call it, I'm on the rubber chicken circuit. I mean, right. Any, any gala luncheon, breakfast, any community thing. And there is a live auction or even a silent auction, but especially the live auctions where you tend to have a little bit more um, higher interest items. And, and to your point, experiences, um, you will see people moving through that decision really primarily, I believe, based on their own personal interest and not the interest of the nonprofit. Right. It, it's to your point. It's like, wow, I've always wanted to go, you know, stay in the Virgin Islands for a week in this, you know, lovely home. 
And oh, by the way, I can help this this nonprofit. So I, I agree with you. I think there's a, um, a, a something to be said for how our um, stakeholders, donors are viewing us and them viewing this activity. Um, it kind of gives them you know, a permission. So let's dig in a little bit more to this value proposition. Um, and what has your research shown you and what are you seeing with how people feel about this? Um, what is the, is there a, a time of year where it's working more than others? Um, talk to us about what you are seeing, especially as we've been locked down for, you know, several years on travel and some of these experiential pieces. Now it's opening back up. What's going on? Yeah, people want to experience everything. You know, that, that pent up demand that was suppressed for many years. And then there was the strike in Hollywood that kind of came right after. People want to go do all of these amazing experiences. They want to go to concerts, to sporting events, mm -hmm. but they want something exclusive and unique. They don't want to just go and sit in the best seats. They want to meet the artists. They want something behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And that's been our um, that's been our focus ever since we started the business. So what, what we have found really successful is is we learned early on you can't treat any two charities the same. So there may be an organization that has an incredible live event with an incredible live auction. People go just to participate in the live auction and it raises a million dollars every night. Yep. We can't reproduce that online, but we're going to go see are there other things we can do outside of the live auction to increase the amount of money that you raise. Mm -hmm. There may be other organizations who have such a small homogenous group that attends their event that they're going out and they're procuring auction packages that they mm -hmm. know Wall yeah. Street executives in New York City are going to want in the month of October. But that yeah. limits the opportunities. They may have incredible opportunities and supporters that they can leverage amongst the global audience outside of their room that benefit from charity buzz. And that's where the light bulb goes off. It's them understanding that if they were to monetize some of these supporters that they didn't even think were exciting because they didn't have the market for it. And that could create meaningful dollars for the organization. That's just, they're sitting on a gold mine. And we do things like that all the time, whether it's, we're working a lot with organizations in LA. So the world of entertainment in Hollywood doesn't appeal to people in Los Angeles. They all they are all the people who run the studios and the management companies and all the entertainment businesses. Mm -hmm. So when you put that type of a set visit in front of them, it's, it's going to work. They're not excited mm -hmm. about it. They'll still give because they care about the organization. Yeah. 10 to 20 X when you put it on charity bus, because outside of that small little community, Everyone mm -hmm. wants to go do that. They want to go visit the set of their favorite TV show. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the value. Like That's how we're leveraging technology. It's through distribution. It's not mm -hmm. here is an online auction. Go promote it to all of your friends and existing supporters. That's great. Creates efficiency. It's seamless. But we want to go find people who otherwise would have not supported your organization. Mm -hmm. Bring them in through unique experiences and auction items. And then... Hopefully you forge a relationship with them after when you thank them for that awesome trip they went on, helped you accomplish X or mm -hmm. feed Y number of families and then build the relationship and think of it as a cultivation opportunity. So walk me through how you engage with a nonprofit and what the process is, because um, going on to your website, it's incredibly robust. The activities are um phenomenally diverse. They are, um, I would say, regionally diverse as well. They're not just all stuck in, you know, major American cities. Um, so there's a lot of ways that folks can get to or participate in your in your offerings. Walk us through, let's say I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, and I run a, a small children's museum. How should I think about Charity Buzz? Yeah, so it all starts with a, a discovery session. Uh, more or less an interview. So we have a really, really great approach, 15 plus years of doing this, raising over half a billion dollars of unearthing who exists within your universe of supporters, board members, sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, pillars of the community. And then we go back and we uh, put together a huge brainstorming strategy 
of what these different folks could offer uh, that would be a really good fit for the site and when to offer it. Uh, Cause you made a really good point before. We just went through a lockdown where everything changed. Well, yeah. we, we're, we're nimble. We're, we're capable of being nimble. So whether it's um, humongous external events that change the way the American consumer engages, or it's certain trends that kind of uh, peak and fall throughout certain parts of the year, we're able to take advantage of that in real time because all we're trying to do every single day of the year is figure out ways to increase fundraising for organizations through the sale of unique experiences and merchandise. So we'll work directly with the organization and go through all of it. And that may yield five auction lots, five private sales opportunities, five, op five experiences that will raise $20,000. And that's great. That's a great way to start. It may yield 50 that will raise a million. The point is, there's not a minimum number of items in order to work with us. We view ourselves as a year round platform that can work with organizations of every shape and size. And whether it's the St. Jude and the LLSs of the world that are fundraising powerhouses, or it's a small volunteer only organization that needs another $10,000 to make sure they can keep their lights on and continue doing really important work. We've figured out ways to help all of them. And that's just based on our mission. That's who we are. Is it the best business practice to have this wide range of strategy and passion for everyone? Probably not, but it's who we are. So we, we're, no one's going to stop us from figuring out how to help this, this small organization that maybe doesn't have seven figure potential because we're getting caught up in who they are, why they decide to start the organization, and we're going to figure out a way to help them. Mm -hmm. So how do we, I mean, you brought this up and, and I totally concur about the competitive nature and the competitive set. You know, the nonprofit sector doesn't always play well together. And so let's going back to our, you know, fictional nonprofit children's museum in, in the central part of our country. Um, how do we engage in this type of fundraising and not get freaked out about losing our cheese to some other organization? Well, that's a good question. So, you know, one of my other like strong beliefs that's been growing more and more recently is I really I've lost patience with people judging why others give. Right. You'll hear it all the time. They only gave because they wanted to uh, hang out with a celebrity or they only gave because they wanted their name on a way for right. their ego. At the end of the day, who cares? The money's going to a place and that place knows how to spend it to focus on their mission. And what's the benefit of criticizing somebody who is giving money? I care about outcomes and output. Uh, the only outcome of criticizing someone is they're not going to do it again. And that is worse off than somebody questioning how altruistic someone's intentions are. So with us, again, everyone knows that a portion of what they spend goes to a charitable organization. It's very transparent. But we have a lot of people who bid and win because they just want to go play the Golf Digest Top 100 course that's just outside of Omaha, Nebraska in the Sandhills. And that's why they're bidding. And you know what? The money goes to the museum or the local Boys and Girls chapter. Great. But I'm bidding because I want to go play golf. It's the last golf course on my list of Top 100 courses. Great. That's why we exist. Because, again, we know the money is going to go to the right place. And then it's incumbent on the organization to close the loop with the winner and say, hey, we heard you had a great time out at the Sand Hills Golf Course. But did you know that that money you gave us to have that great experience helped us do X? We'd love to continue to communicate you with you and invite you up to an upcoming event. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're right there. And you help fulfill a dream of theirs. They're, they're like already indebted to you. So there's all these like different ways that you can use the platform to cultivate and engage new donors or at the end of the day, just new money. And then you put the money to work and everybody's better off as a result. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think Ben was really interesting is one of the things that, uh, you know, we've learned from the pandemic and then the digital nature of fundraising and, and communication is that we don't have to be hogtied to 
going back to our little museum in Omaha, just the folks in Omaha, right? We can open up our, our vision to, to getting support from folks all over. And that is a lot less perilous when you start looking at, you know, how you're going to fundraise and who you're going to connect with. And you started off the top of the show by just, you know, hammering the folks that are in your database and sticking with that. It's, it's not going to help you grow if you can't look at this with the eye of cultivation. So. I was just out in LA at a, a conference and, and at the end of the conference, um, a CEO and a board member of a very popular, very successful uh, organization in LA came up to us. They shared a story that five years prior, they had sold uh, tickets to a show at the Hollywood Bowl for $2,000. Nothing you know, to, to fall over, but still a good amount of money. And the board member decided he was going to go to the Hollywood Bowl, live close by, and just say thank you to the person who was attending who won. And let them know that the money went to a really good cause. Okay. That winner, the $2,000 auction item, has since donated over seven figures and joined the board of the organization. So it's every opportunity <laughs> is a good opportunity. If yeah. you just focus, it's not going to happen 100% of the time. But you know what? It happens 5% of the time with that type of return it's worth it. So yeah, it's always about expect, And that's where innovation comes from is if we just continue to live within this little circle, we shouldn't expect any bigger results or returns. We're trying to expand it. Um, and again, just to be able to send more money to charities because they need it. And quite frankly, they deserve it. Yeah. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation. I love uh, I love your energy and your vibe. I think uh, it, it's been a really interesting way to um, kind of reframe what some of our opportunities are and how we can be thinking about things. Um, because I think that in great times of duress, you know, and change, we, we have an amazing opportunity. But I see that window of opportunity closing. And too many organizations are going back to the same old, same old. You know, that mentality of like, whew, okay, the lockdown's over. We can go back to the same old, you know, rubber chicken dinner. And then we're just going to get the same results, right? Versus like what you said, embracing this innovation, taking some risk and looking at things a little differently, um, which is really ultimately, you know, might not work. But for the most part, um, if you don't try, you're not going to know. And so you've got to be more assertive with taking some risks and looking at this. Um, ben Irwin, really fun to chat with you today, CEO of Charity Buzz. Check out charitybuzzbuzz.com and you will learn more about um, one of the, the um, items that they have on for auction, the, the uh, George Clooney piece for his foundation. But just their approach and what they're doing and what this can look like, it's a fascinating way to look at fundraising in a new and different way um, that can really kind of pull you back and, and to Ben's point, look at the piece of the pie, look at the whole pie and not just the piece, right? What is that going to reflect um, when it comes to your fundraising and, and your approach and your point of entry? I think that's the other thing. Um, I will forever remember the, the board chair going to the Hollywood Bowl. Classic. That's that's a fabulous story. I just love it because <laughs> donors don't get thanked enough, right? Nope. They don't. And especially in that personal way, fabulous. Um, that was really a cool thing to share with us. A great reminder, Ben. Again, Ben Irwin, CEO of Charity Buzz. Check out Charity Buzz. You know, we are really fortunate that we have our stakeholders and, and they come to us in the form of our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new show on Fridays, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out so we can have these great conversations. Um, ben, you don't I don't know if you know this, but at every show we have this mantra that we sign off with we've done it for now we're in our fifth year 1100 shows and it's so interesting to me because it it's very reminiscent of the sign behind you which i believe says do good live well right yeah okay so our mantra is this and we'll sign off today as we do every day and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well <laughs>